was um, Scotland, going up to Bitlochley and all those places. Uh, Wales, of course, Hulas, um, and Aberystwyth, and all those places. So I love Britain. And then, of all places, suddenly Britain shows up and asks me, would you like to work for us? And I said, well, uh, well where would that be? And they came up with Helsinki. Oh, and I said, oh, thank you very much, Carl. <laughs> The uh, second option was Copenhagen, and I said, I mean, commuting from here to Copenhagen, too near. Not enough, not, not interesting, not good enough yet for me. So um, I just waited for a while, and then they came up with Edinburgh, Scotland, and I said, well, that is a pretty good choice, so why not Edinburgh, Scotland? And then it turned out to be uh, Seattle. Uh, and what I know about is Seattle, what you may be. No, Space Needle, maybe the World Exhibition in 1902, maybe, you know, a little bit about Vancouver, pretty close. I didn't know much about Seattle, just I liked it. I wanted to do it. Uh, and so we kind of, as you said, yeah, we jumped. And today, I would love to share some things, some ideas, some experiences, maybe some stories, maybe whatever you like, about those excellent, brilliant, wonderful years in the Pacific Northwest. And of course, questions are welcome anytime. Uh, you know, I just don't want to talk away and uh, kind of bore you. So if there's anything you would like to know, just jump in. Uh, I remember very well, so when it was, when they came up with Seattle, uh, they said, okay, you go over and that's the good Institute, right? Also, as you said about Hamburg, Jens, there's the Consulate General in Seattle, and my home base would be Seattle, and I would have to report to the consulate, etc. They said, well, great, wonderful. So everything looked nice and wonderful, except it wasn't. So when we came over, we had nothing. House was here. We had a huge container somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic. Uh, there we were, family wives, living in a hotel. The Goethe Institute was closed the day before. We arrived in Seattle, so my home base would be San Francisco. <laughs> However, working out of Seattle, but still, home security institute was closed. Also, the consulate general closed and turned into a honorary consul. Yeah. So it was just one person from Germany for the whole Pacific Northwest. That was me. And Pacific Northwest means Alaska, and you know, uh, Alaska is not the tiniest of states, uh, a pretty large one. Um, it was in Wyoming, in the middle of nowhere, of course. It's, it was Montana. Montana is one of the size of Germany. Mm -hmm. Germany has about 82 million people, or, you know, and Montana has about 800,000. Yeah. Like that. Uh, it was Idaho. You know, with places like Pocatello and Big Hole and all those unusual names. <laughs> Washington State, yes, Seattle and Oregon. Oregon, parts of Utah, and parts of Northern California. So one person and the whole of Western Europe and a bit more. So that was, uh, you know, the area when I came, came there. Um, and again, I'm not going to show you holiday or vacation pictures. This thing is very slow, but I'm trying to do this. OK. Good Institute, it's not a British flag, I'm sorry. Uh, it's very American, of course. So there I was. In the meantime, I knew no good Institute in Seattle. I, lived, I worked out of uh, the Office of Superintendent for Public School Instruction. Mm -hmm. And when I met the people there, what did they know about Germany? Oh, yes, of course, you would find people like you, for example, uh, you, who you could talk about Günther Grass and class German literature. But there was maybe just one person out of two million. So somebody like Bob Woofter in Anchorage, or Margot Perry in Laramie, or um, Cara, Cara the Angel right in Kerala. What would they know about Germany? Usually, 
this. <laughs> of course, I mean, you know, I'm not driving an Audi. <laughs> but this is when you talk to people uh, in the US, in the Northwest of Germany, it is either Audi, nice car, isn't it? <laughs> or, oh, I just have to step up and down again. Or, of course, the Beamer. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Beamer is a big thing when you can drive only 70 miles an hour, which is about 105 kilometers per hour. So why would you have that? Well, they love it. Or, of course, a Porsche. The Porsche. The Porsche. Yes. <laughs> the Porsche, yeah. Well, that's it. Sometimes people will talk about uh, German technology, like the ice train. You know the ice train, the ICE. But they call it ice train. <laughs> the ice train. Or sometimes when you meet older people, older than us of course, uh, yes what they know would be yeah, yeah. Neuschwanstein <laughs> of course. <laughs> you know, kind of Disney Neuschwanstein. Uh, well, and why not? Sometimes if you're lucky you find a young man, maybe like you, maybe a little younger. Uh, oh. Rammstein. <laughs> when it comes to you know rock music, kind of hard rock music, yeah. Rammstein is pretty big, pretty big out there mm -hmm. for younger, whatever that means. Let's say youngish people. Mm -hmm. So Rammstein, or mm -hmm. people slightly older. Nina, Nina, the '99 red balloons. It's a big thing. Yes. Do you remember? Her? Yeah. yeah. I didn't never like it, but they do. Some do. And sometimes when you talk to people, you know, when they come to Germany, they come up with names like Schweinsteiger. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Schweinsteiger. Yeah. Yeah. Bastian Schweinsteiger, or there was once a Schalke player called okay. Jörg Bumi. <laughs> Jörg Böhm. So that is the situation. Uh, when you compare America or, and Britain with each other, in what they know about Germany, then they know about next to nothing. Yeah. Uh, next to nothing. So Germany, when you think of CBN, CNN, uh, NSNBC, PBS, all those TV stations, Germany just plays a very, very tiny little role in the American consciousness. And that's, of course, where the Goethe Institute comes in, and this is the official kind of, you know, kind of official principle, uh, what we call in German the Linienhofgabe. That's a nice name, isn't it? The Linienhofgabe. You can read that fast as I can read it to you, so. That's a challenge. Sounds interesting, huh? <laughs> Sounds interesting. So there's one person, one person in Seattle, respectively Olympia, the capital, who has to do all this. Almost impossible. I mean, it's not it's impossible. There's nothing you can do about it. If you want to have this in German, uh, it's longer, as always. English is so much shorter and more to the point. But just in case. of fly over to uh, the West Coast and just give you a brief overview of where the Good Institute is, was it is, uh, and of course we have to start with New York. That's the center of all good activities. Because New York is the one city where everything that is important has been invented in the last five minutes. So that's why Good must be there and that's the center for everything. Good Institute in New York, First Avenue, right next to Walmart Central Park. <coughs> so it's not it's not especially inexpensive to have an office there. But you know, Good has to be right there. And of course, yes, every now and then they have brilliant, wonderful cultural exhibition in Central Station. I mean, it costs quite a bit of our tax money, your money. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have millions of people almost every day running through Central Station and seeing something, posters, uh, pictures, movie clips, hear something about Germany, music, see faces and all that. So kind of Germany on the run. But that is one of the main tasks New York Institute has to do. Second, going down south, 
Washington, I mean, that's obvious. Washington, D.C. Obvious. Embassy right there, uh, Goethe Institute, the Deutsche Akademische Austauschdienst. Yeah, the D A A D. D A A D. Have you ever worked with that? Yeah. Okay, so you know all about the D A A D, D A A D. And also, right there in Washington, D.C., there's the one and only German school. Not just a language school like you on Sundays or Saturdays, it's a whole it's a German school where you can, well, just make your baccalaureate or abi to if you like. So, Washington, D.C. The secret center, not secret service, Chicago. Chicago is, of course, uh, the most important for Goethe because they sit right there, Wisconsin, um, with a huge population with German heritage, which is Indiana, Ohio especially, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Uh, so Goethe has to be strong there, but also places like Dakotas. Have you ever been? I mean, you have been to the States, but Dakotas? Yeah. North? Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, and all those places. You have to love solitude or loneliness. You have to, to live there. But there are German teachers, there are German speakers, and they just want Goethe to do it. So Goethe in Chicago is pretty strong. Of course, there's Boston, but you know, this transparency is too small. Uh, so, <laughs> and from here, to San Francisco, there's a whole lot of nothing in between. States like Oklahoma, uh, like you know, like Wyoming, Colorado, Texas, and all those places, and then the Rockies, and going on and going on and going on, and right in the middle of the diaspora, you find the center of my world, the good institute in San Francisco, um, sitting smack down in the city center in a kind of hostile environment. Um, there are hardly any German speakers. Most of them are, I mean, hostile in the of commas. Uh, from Mexico, from Nicaragua, in Guatemala, and go down to Southern California, it's bilingual. I mean, almost monolingual Spanish all the way. Uh, so to support German there is quite challenging. Mm -hmm. um, and if it's not, Spanish or Hispanic, then it's Asian, Chinese, yeah, of course. Uh, Mong, H M O N G, which is Cambodia. Mm -hmm. So, Kampuchea, I mean, that's the word I think. Kampuchea. So, or Vietnamese. Uh, so, you find a couple of Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, and maybe here and there just a solitary German person. Goethe Institute right there. Um, and yes, there are a couple of more centers like Friends of Goethe in Atlanta or a big one right up north in Toronto, responsible for all of Canada, which is even worse than Chicago. So briefly, maybe, briefly have a look into the structure, then we go into what, I'm, what I was doing there. An institute consists of three people, mostly. I mean, the director, always German, always from Germany, always feeling of himself or herself as the one cultural good person. So he's the guy or she's the person for cultural work, meaning lectures, meaning movie nights, meaning exhibitions, meaning literary readings, and so on and so forth. So this person is always there, and he or she, they are from Germany. Second person language department. Yep, good it teaches German. Um, so inside they have rooms like this, smaller, bigger, technically totally equipped um, for people who want to learn German. Mm -hmm. And who are those people? They are mostly business people. Mm -hmm. So they don't teach German grammar. Well, thank God they don't. <laughs> they don't teach just vocabulary corpses. Nobody would can think of using them. So they teach business German, they teach admin German for people who go here to European councils in Strasbourg or Brussels. Uh, they teach medical English. And also in 2000, and, gosh, four? When were the Winter Olympics in 
Utah. Let's say 2004. And Utah, Salt Lake City. So they come up the course for people who work in the catering business, for all the German tourists who came over. And so there were lots and lots of young people who wanted to learn German so they could easily talk to German people and get more, you know, more money. So that's the reason why people want to learn German. This is second part. And then there are people like me, uh, lone wolves, who are with the, ins with the institute in, let's say, Chicago or San Francisco, but who don't live there. You know, like in Toronto, the language consultant. So my position was officially a liaison official, uh, and also the German language consultant. That is a nice name. Nice title. So we are kind of lived in the outbacks. Uh, Toronto and Edmonton, that's about two days of flight. Uh, for me, it was San Francisco and Seattle. I could easily have gone to Alaska. So, like Seattle, where I lived, where I worked out of, once a week there was a meeting within the Institute. So, a morning flight to San Francisco, a taxi right to the Institute do the conference work, take a flight back home. Uh, as you said, yes, uh, part of my life was definitely in the plane. And I can tell you, this is not exactly a family-friendly job. Uh, you just work for weekends. So, when you think of all these strange and unusual things, yes, the part of my job, or the job we have as language consultants is, to get more young people into German courses, be it elementary school, be it junior high, elementary, which is primary in English, primary school, yeah, uh, secondary schools and colleges and universities. Because if those people don't take German, the German courses are just axed. They go. If you don't have customers, I mean, students are customers, your job goes. So the Goethe Institute and we, supported with all we could the German teachers like professors or just teachers and whatever to get more kids into their classes. Why German is for you, you know. So it seems, it seemed as if, you know, the kind of hierarchy was students and students, pupils in English, British English, but they're all students over there. First motivate students and then motivate teachers. That's the theory, which is wrong. The idea is first educate, train, support, encourage, motivate whatever teachers. With teachers, I think of professors just as well as high school teachers. They have to be the real, real promoters of German culture, German language, and all things German. So sometimes you go into schools and you find unusual things. The kind of grocery store with überraschungs like that. And all those licorice, you know, wonderful little things from Germany they brought bring over, and they just sell it. Candy bars. But uh, the were a big thing. So they all wanted to have hundreds of Überraschungs items so they could sell that to their kids. And there were children and young people who just took German because the sweets were so good, like gummy bears. <laughs> you know, yeah. Gummy bears. Yes? Haribo, you know. Haribo. Haribo. Haribo, gummy bears with a big thing, of course. So, teachers first. Um, so, what we had to do was, first of all, really motivate and encourage teachers with, with whatever was in our, you know, grasp, if you like. Sometimes when I visited universities or schools, I looked like somebody from Carnival in Köln, the procession, you know. I had my books, I had my wonderful, you know, laptops and stuff. Well, laptops in those days, uh, maybe, maybe overhead projector. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> if you, you know what that is. But I also have posters yeah, poster. and magnets for the fridges. So when I came in there and I wanted to talk to the kids and I talked to them, I stared in the black eyes and they didn't get a word from what I was saying. But soon I came up with posters and everything was fine. You know, or how is in Wolfsburg and all those Bundesliga, the Bundesliga, I, they sent me autographs and even now and then, I'm sorry to say that, that I believe, t-shirt, you know, jersey, the big thing. So you have, 
you have all those kids writing, not because the German language is so great. It's posters, magnets, brochures, booklets, sweets. Sweets, yeah. So, yes, it sounds great, culture work, but it's also ground work, grassroots work, mm -hmm. really. However, let me just bring in, is that too small? I don't want to read all this, but you, I'm sure you can see right here, service for German teachers in the USA. Here, Jens, you mentioned the former ETTS and EQSR. Those institutes, institutions train or educate teachers. In the US, maybe similar to Britain, I don't know, education is pretty poor. So in effect, the good institute trains and practices German teachers. So we, I mean, we as a as a population, we as taxpayers kind of pay for the teacher education of German teachers in the US. Mm -hmm. Interesting to know. So continuing education, um, award of excellence, I'm going to talk about that for a while. Exchange program, mm -hmm. one of the big things, like it's called GAP, German-American partnership programs. So we have hundreds of German gymnasiums waiting for partner schools in the US. There are maybe 10 or 15 waiting. So but this the greatest thing of all to have an exchange program between German gymnasium, mostly gymnasium, and American high schools. So this is a strong, let's say, instrument or tool to really uh, work together and promote German culture via language. Briefly, I would like to exp uh, share with you a few of those, I think, especially interesting uh, projects. Three or four big ones. Like the World Language Day for high school students in Seattle, the UW, UW Washington. But well, nobody says University of Washington, it's UW. Um, well, once a year, there are two, three thousand of high school graduates who are invited to the university for a World Language Day. The idea behind all this is to get students into the German program or into the Vietnam, Vietnamese program or, or Spanish is not prominent, but maybe Mandarin, whatever. So it's World Language Day. Um, let me just briefly, if this comes up, it does. You know, mm -hmm. Chinese speaking, tour of Spain, Alien vocabulary in, in what? Well, Japanese that was. Where do we have German? Oh, right here. For example, you know, that was 19, uh, 20, 2012 last year. I wasn't there. When I came, it was mostly a lecture on German literature, like good or classical music, which is all good and fine, classical music, or the development of the German city. And what you have is an audience maybe half the size of this, you know. Mm -hmm. When I came there for the first time, I watched it and I said, well, we should change this. First time I did it in 2001 was, I came up with a video from a handball game. I mean, not handball like, you know, in, in, in America, like squash, no, it's like TRV, here, handball. Mm -hmm. So I had about 300 high school kids, a huge screen, and of course TRV played against Barcelona, and they beat the hell out of them. And they liked it. It's creative, it's physical, it's uh, you know dynamic. So many goals are scored, and they said, well, they are rioting. The audience in Kiev, right? But they loved it. And yes, those little tiny bits really bring young kids into university classes to learn German. Again, it's not good or it's not architecture, it's not uh, modern art. It is joy and fun and fun and more fun. If it's not fun, forget it. As simple as that. And this is why pop music, for example, is a good thing. Um, you know, also, 
And you see down, just down there, German geography. Test your knowledge of all things German and German related. Prices in brackets. You were actually like that. And got me better how you go. Well, you know what? That's what the daily work of a language consultant also is. Like this, for example. Second example. A bit more serious. The Deutsche Sommerschule on Pacific sounds a bit bad, doesn't it? Brilliant, a wonderful private university. There was Lewis and Clark College, quite expensive, something like eighty thousand dollars a year. Eighty. 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 Eighty thousand dollars. Yeah. So that's uh, not bad. Eighty thousand. Uh, so right there. The, the welcome to the German Sommerschule and Pacific. It's about two weeks, two weeks, end of July, first week of August, where you have teachers for you know teacher training and, and all that, teacher education, and you have students, university students. Uh, and it is supported and sponsored by the Goethe Institute via your tax money. So people, students who go there can earn their credits towards their BA or bachelor or then even towards their uh, MA or sometimes even PhD students. So usually a credit at a university is quite expensive, you know that, a uh, couple of hundred dollars. Good to offer that for a lesser price, so people are just rushing. Uh, it's not gummy bears, it's not the rational side, it's just money. <laughs> so people go there for two weeks, 12 credits, I mean that is a good thing, 12 credits actually is about a thousand dollars worth. And is it here, right here? I don't know. Uh, maybe, do I have a program? I should have it somewhere. Yep. Like this. I mean, as you see, have a brief look at the, at the curriculum right there. You see, it's slightly more than just handball theory at Barcelona. It's a bit more than talking about gummy bears and so on. Uh, language course is a pretty high level. So most speakers are very fluent, I must say, right there. Uh, film seminar, four credits, and maybe, you know, Things like theater workshops, which is drama. Uh, drama not only as a workshop, you know, like like playing on the stage or acting on the stage, but studying German drama also. And für alle Studenten geeignet German und europäische Nachkriegsgeschichte. Like Goethe kind of teaches Germany in Europe and Europe in Germany. You know, like that. So we never just put off we. Goethe never only promotes Germany as such, but also Germany and Europe, Europe and Germany. And that's uh, a quite typical program. So as you see, this kind of curriculum and work is a little more serious. Uh, it's not easy to do this, uh, lecturing and teaching them um, in a kind of lecturing hall with no air conditioning, uh, when you, although it's quite you know, upscale price-wise, uh, when you go back to your dorm, dormitory and room, it's not a nice hotel room, it's like a prison cell. Uh, well, but it's great fun. It's great fun and hard work, I must say. But you see, this combination, these two tension poles, kind of fun and joy and all that, and at the same time, pretty serious work on all things German and European, is indeed interesting enough. Let's go back here. Yep, every now and then we bring in artists, writers, uh, and they do readings, of course. And yes, all the teachers and all the professors, like you would understand everything. Students, kind of, you know, they just sit there, smile, uh, and hopefully they'll give away afterwards. And still they say, well, we study German. So it's again, teachers, we have to motivate to get the kids back in again. And we have artists, I mean, we say Goethe as a whole, 
Have you heard of voice guides? Mm -hmm. You have. Of course, uh, they, we send them out on a tour right across the United States. Uh, well, the price was not especially low, but it worked. So they went from different universities, from you know several universities to high school, and hundreds of guys came in and just loved it, and they were perfect. And Uwe Kind, have you heard of, the, of him? No, no, no. He's not a big guy. But he is even more popular than Grönemeyer or whoever, or Rammstein. Um, if you, uh, I mean, maybe you don't understand why that is. Uh, will you give me just a minute to play part of what he does? Let's see if it works, I'm not sure. It's called Lingotech. Lingotech. As always, it takes a second. Lingo tech. So again, this, this shows up. Weekend is a guy like this, uh, techno expert. He's about 65 years old. Lives in New York. Um, well, you know, does it come up? When he is in schools, they just love him. They go out and kind of repeat his phrases again and again and again. And that's what he, uh -huh, here we go. Um, you know, I don't have speakers, just a little one, so I'm glad with you we're just about 10 people. Let's see if it works. Ich bin cool, bist du cool? Ich bin cool, bist du cool? Ich bin cool, bist du cool? Ja, no, ja. Ich bin cool, bist du cool? Ja, no, ja. Ich bin cool, bist du cool? Ja, no, ja. Ich bin cool, bist du cool? Ja, no, ja. Ich bin cool, bist du cool? Ja, no, ja. Ich bin cool, bist du cool? Ja, no, ja. for maybe kind of 11, 12, 13 year old who just have to make up their mind to take German or not to take German. Everyone tells them German is so hard. Ah, that's the old language. Difficult rules. Zwei wie Präposition. And all the strange things. And suddenly there comes this movie kid and he says, bist du cool, bist du cool, ja, no, no, ja. And that, like you, almost. 200 young people sitting there, ja, no, no, ja. Bist du wunderbar, or whatever it was. So those are the kind of tools uh, Goethe tries to employ to get young people into serious studies of German. With, you know, that is something. Music. Um, and of course, yeah, briefly, the International Theatre Festival for Children in Seattle. Big thing, big thing. Sponsored by Boeing, with about 1.5 million, sponsored also by IKEA out in Seattle by almost 1.2 million, sponsored also by the Goethe Institute San Francisco with $700. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, but with this, <laughs> at least we were right on the flyer with Boeing and IKEA and Goethe Institute right there, and they had the money to bring in a group from Erfurt to play a little German puppet theater piece. So again, we then, as language consultants, we did the work for the teachers, we invited them all in, no international sign of this time. Uh, you know, we, we prepared them. How could you prepare your students so they could understand, can understand the theater play? So we worked with the teachers methodologically. 
how to creep out that student and then they go there. So pretty complicated thing, but Goethe works with the restaurants and the big guys, like writers and like artists like Uwe Kim and you know, and also the theater festival. And with podcasts and with all that, goal of the month, you can see that. One of the most successful programs we had was the Trans Atlantic Soccer Cup, the Good Soccer Cup, uh, sponsored by Mercedes Benz and by the Deutsche Fußballbund. And I'm proud to say our Shiam Herr, you know, was Jürgen Klinsmann yeah. uh, yeah. before he became, you know. Yeah. Uh, coach of the German as well. So Jürgen Klinsmann, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, before we went with him, uh, he was just a kind of soccer player for me, a good player, kind of, you know. Well, I was amazed and surprised by how successful this man is and how he can motivate young people, fascinating, excellent, great. So he was willing. He said, well, when I was young, I didn't have a chance to learn languages. I didn't have a chance to make my RV2, as he said. And I want to help you. So, and of course, he was on the good ticket, which was before that quite something for him. So this good soccer cup, or the Transatlantic Soccer Cup, was a soccer tournament, British English football, but football is different than that. Soccer. So, only co-ed teams could play, boys and girls together, co-ed, and only students who were enrolled in German classes could take part. Only German speakers. Uh, and what was the incentive? Well, the winning team was flown by Lufthansa, free of course, sponsored by Lufthansa, and Mercedes-Benz to Sporthochschule Kalf in somewhere in the Schwarzwald, somewhere there. And now they had coaches like uh, Lidbarski, you know, kind of bent in <laughs> uh, And what was his name? Another Stuttgart player. Stuttgart, well, whatever. So kids really loved to be there. And the first prize again was a flight to Germany, two weeks, coach plus chaperone plus teacher. And enrollment in German, co in German courses rose by about 40 percent in southern california where everybody speaks spanish and nobody speaks german at all but they wanted to play soccer and they wanted to go to germany and they loved kinsman so that was one of the most successful programs we really have it began in san francisco and pleasant and near oakland and then we decided to do this in a whole northwest we had a soccer tournament in alaska the Huskies played against the whatever. Uh, we had that, of course, in Washington State, where the Cougars played against the Bears. But it was all German. Uh, and it was a totally German immersion. You know, that was something which was much more successful even than the Gallagher's. Soccer. And right now, well, the money is, as always, a little tight. But the goal of the month and step into German, and soccer still plays a huge part in advocating German. You know. Well, German Jews, we had enough of that. I think mm. I just give you something. Mm. Well, <coughs> can you make sure that? It's waffled and Ayatefel and Afla and Waffleta, Mold and Tanzel and Akfel and all that. When we began, I mentioned that I was the only person to promote German and German culture and all that in the in Northwest, in the whole great Northwest, as they say. And how can you do this? It's almost impossible because all the big conferences, or they call that Staats Congress, state congresses for language teachers, uh, take place in the same month, the same weekend, almost the same weekend. So you can have something like Wofford, which is Washington, where I was, 
Association of Foreign Language Teachers, or AFLA, Alaskan Foreign Language Teacher Association, or IATEFL, IAFLT, Idaho Association, and all the rest of it. More this Montana, and Coastal this Oregon, and whatever. So it is almost impossible, if you're in the right mind, to do all this with teachers, and they need to support the Goethe Institute at the same time. You just can't do that. It's impossible. It's not only in, well, in April. I mean, Alaska and Wyoming, maybe in May, winter, snow, prince and all that. And then again in September. And then again, they have it in October and in June. It is the same weekend all over. So what you have to do, what I have to do, is whether well, I don't want to be there all the time. Impossible. And so I began something I'm still doing to a lesser degree now, <laughs> now that I'm out of it. Uh, I try to network. Networking is the big word. Networking means, in this case, traveling the states, identifying talented teachers, identifying charismatic people, uh, who then I would pull together with good money, like 10,000 euros for a week, uh, go together in places like Flathead Lake in Montana, beautiful place, well, except the wildfires. You are there and you train your trainers to teach teachers to teach better. So I have the people there, I train them to train teachers to teach better. Kind of meta teaching. <laughs> so we had most unusual people there. Sometimes they were, so we had people from Alaska, from all the state, three or four. So kind of, kind of um, regionalizing. We had a little tiny good network in Alaska, two or three people network in Wyoming, and so on and so forth, in all the states. And I was kind of meta teacher, or meta trainer if you like. Um, and we worked, and they were very, very willing to work with me. Uh, I didn't pay them much, I just paid Good, not me. We paid um, airfare, travel, and accommodation, and nothing. That's it. And they just wanted to do it. And we had situations where the trailer work was, and I would love to show you a couple of pictures if you let me. Yeah, I know. I mean, this is picture number one. And I apologize for the poor quality. Um, somehow it didn't work well. So this was one of the first venues where we did the, or trained the training workshops. Isn't that nice? Mm -hmm. Queen Mary, Long Beach, the old one. Mm -hmm. There was just once. So that was the beginning where we just wanted to motivate them. So Long Beach, we all we flew them all down, all meaning 18 people. So we had almost a, a roster of 18 people. And the first train to train mission was right there on this old ship. It was a transporter between the world wars. You know. Excellent, brilliant, unforgettable for all of them. I'm sure you understand that. <laughs> yes, Long Beach. And of course, sometimes hotels like you know, like this out there. Also nice kind of winter. Skiing, yes, so you remember when we went skiing first, I was pretty poor at doing that. Now, uh, a bit better. <laughs> but we worked there also, so work in hotels like that. So this was the beginning when money was there, or it was in universities, you know, just like that. Maybe it looks like, looks like Boston, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Are we going down in quality? Kind of. This is an old, they call that a, a historic monastery. It's not historic, it's of 1925. Uh, but right on the Ottawa River, the Ottawa, mm -hmm. north of Ottawa. Uh, we work there, pretty secluded, tough work, good work, excellent work. So those were the interesting, nice places. And then, getting down to smaller ones. Like, this is actually called the back house. The back house. Yeah, the back house. Yeah, um, 
Yes, we went there three times a year with the Washington trainers, right in the Cascade Mountains, near Snoqualmie Pass, what a name. Um, the first weekend I stayed there and slept with all of them in bunk beds, you know, mm -hmm. bunk beds, and it was squeaky and noisy and ah, somewhat less than sensational. Uh, so I kind of decided next time to stay down a little better. It was a summit hotel, so I think I needed that. And also, Queen Mary, and this is one of the little cottages right smack in the middle of the rainforest. We did our workshop right there. So when you drove into the forest, it always said, be bear aware, or this is bear country. So, you know, after a long day of work, doing workshop, training workshop for the teachers out there, and you have your fill of red wine or whatever it was, uh, you thought maybe twice if you really wanted to go out at night, you know, across the yard to find the restroom. Uh, so you had to find other ways. Yeah. It was quite unusual to do that, as you can imagine. But still, unforgettable to do this in little places. That was the workshop college. Right there, we got together and worked. And I mean, working, and we talked about how we can teach literature better in a surrounding like that. There was no diversion, but they were all there, and they couldn't leave, which was good. Yeah. But they didn't want to go. But that is also Queen Mary, the one there, and then this is a state park somewhere. Silver Falls. I mean, Silver Falls sounds nice. Like this. I mean, we did the same thing later on in Guatemala, in Monterrey, Mexico, and in Costa Rica, uh, because this trainer and networking stuff worked pretty well. So I traveled to Costa Rica, and there we sat, right under those wonderful little umbrellas, working. Right. This is a good example. So, two of my best, excellent trainers, uh, Fung Chi Nguyen, Vietnamese American, a German professor. Can you imagine that? And she got a pretty high rate of interest for university students. I think because she was so good in German. Funchi, yes. And Joe Sanders, my top trainer, double PhD, uh, decorated with the German Bundesverdienstkreuz, uh, in her classes, uh, high school teacher, high school teacher, by the way. High school teacher Joe taught the Nibelungen Lied. I mean, kind of reduced the quality. But nevertheless, they did that right up in Bartlett High School, Anchorage. And Joe Sanders, they did. Tristan and Isolde, and she was the biggest person of all. She is still most famous when it comes to German in the United States. She was my top trainer, and she is still a good friend. Uh, when you go up there, and you don't say you're coming, uh, you go to a house, and suddenly her husband comes up with a gun in his hand and asks him, who's trying to steal my car? So you have to be careful out there. <laughs> Right now, she is something like 70 years old, so she's not exactly the youngest of all, and she is the principal of the Rilke Schule, mm -hmm. that's a private school right now, teaching German and Norwegian, <coughs> immersion-wise, in Anchorage. So there are a lot of Norwegian people, I don't know why, maybe yeah. the climate, maybe yeah. whatever. The German and Norwegian immersion, the Rilke Schule, partly sponsored by the German government, the Goethe Institute, of course. Uh, and I'm always so happy when she asks me if I'm willing to do a little workshop over there. Um, last time I was there was ah, three years ago, 2010. So I'm hoping. <laughs> because Alaska is something. Yep. So as you see, Training work is hard work, no fun at all. Uh, sometimes you find people who look a little like a cowboy, mm -hmm. and Pete Kastner is a cowboy. 
Uh, and those are the people you work with. You cannot expect a trainer or a teacher, like you know, like a typical German teacher. Is anybody here a teacher? Mm. Oh, oh, you are. <laughs> you, yeah, of course. Then you know. I mean, jacket, of course, no. tie, and all that. Some, yeah, uh, over, over, uh, over yeah. something. <laughs> yeah. over. If my top trainer, Pete Kastner and Walter Süß, Walter Süß. Um, a Czech born of Jewish domination, lived in Vienna for a while, then taught at a Jesuit school in Spain, went on to Bogota, Colombia, came to Bellingham near Seattle, and is a professor of German there. Right now he lives in Dresden again. He's about six feet, maybe something like two meters. Tall guy, unusual guy. He's not exactly when it comes to methodology, he's not the greatest person, but what a charisma this guy has. So he just shows up and talks and shows and whatever. What was that? What was that? Well, maybe they would. Uh, well, whatever. Maybe, maybe it happens. I don't know what happened. So those were the people we worked with for a while, and they are still kind of there, kind of. Um, we still are in contact and whenever, like this summer, I was there. Let's see what happens here for a while. Uh, the contact is there, and I would recommend that for a second we have a water break. And so I just see what, what went wrong here with the hmm? technology equipment. No okay. problem. Okay? Yeah. I don't know what this was. Sure. It's it turned off. But why? Hmm. Do we have is the power gone? Yeah. What happened? Was it passiert? Ich weiß es nicht. Ich habe nur gesehen, dass es ausging. Ja. Eine Frage. This is a reminder not to overdo it. 
So we are already approaching 8 o'clock or something, so this was a nice reminder. <laughs> uh, this is a building thing. By now, you know that working there as a lonely person and a person alone is not a good thing. It's not a possibility. So you have to find reliable persons, reliable people who do the work for you, <laughs> more or less. But you can, well, um, right now, there are about 40,000 German, German students. Of course, Spanish is foreign language number one. And after Spanish, almost nothing. And then it's Chinese mm -hmm. and all those Asian languages. Mm -hmm. um, and Latin. Of course. And then a long, long list of nothing. And then it comes France, French. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, I mean, you're looking kind of amazed. Because when you go to Montreal or Montreal, I know that's Canada. But still, in that part of the United States, French is still a good thing, a good, you know. Um, Quebec mm -hmm. is in Canada, but almost radiates into the United States as well. And then Germany, and then German. About 4% of the total student body takes German. And right now, it seems as if Germany and Germany is getting a kind of special e-life status that people who really want to kind of be on the way up, uh, be proud of themselves, and learn and learn. They take German because it is said to be difficult. It's kind of a special reputation they have. So uh, right now, uh, Goethe kind of tends into the direction of supporting this attitude because the average student takes Spanish, if language at all. People, as you know, and this again is different uh, from, the, from the United Kingdom. In the USA, if you don't, if something is not mandatory, if it's an elective, like foreign languages, and most foreign languages are electives, most of them, well, why would you take it? In the United States, if something is not mandatory, you only take it when it's a good investment into your future, when it brings you money or saves you money, which is about the same. So if somebody can take German and then get credits cheap from the Good Institute, that is a good thing. Like, you know, let me just give you an example of soccer, for example. Um, you may remember my, my son was a, was a pretty good soccer player. In the United States, it's rec soccer, recreational soccer. Everybody can do that, rec soccer. If you want to play, just do it. But the real thing is select suck. Select, select. So you go to tryouts. And then if it's a top club like Emerald City in Seattle or Washington Premier in Tacoma, there's a tryout. And if you are selected, and if you are on the roster for the U15 or U18 team, then you are happy, and you are happy to pay about $6,000 a year. Only because your son or daughter uh, you know, can practice with a top club. The idea behind this is, if you spend something like $20,000 in three years on soccer, maybe he or she can get a right a scholarship at a university. So many Americans are not so much interested in soccer, but they see that as investment, mm -hmm. which is an interesting idea. Maybe not what I would prefer, but that's what it is. And so somehow, it's like this. Goethe right now thinks of offering scholarships for students to take German at school. So another kind of tool to get more young people into learning German. More young people who are ambitious. And the idea behind Goethe's whole thing is always to kind of develop a picture of modern Germany, not the Germany of the Second World War and all the rest of it. You know, you know that, of course. So the decision makers, sooner or later, on state level or maybe, you know, federal level, if they know a bit of German, like John Kerry, for example, uh, it could be helpful. Could be. So briefly, let me just kind of um, build it up. Yes, why learn German? We have that. 
Yes, yodeling. yodeling. <laughs> Don't expect me to yodel for you. You know, what I talked to you and what I shared with you right now was mostly what is our everyday work. Everyday work meaning traveling a lot, uh, visiting universities, talking to principals, lobby work, developing uh, lobby work like with the state governments and so on, always saying what is in it for you. So that's the most interesting question. We always have to make sure to the people, to explain to people, the decision makers, the movers and shakers, what's in it for you. If it's money, it's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the biggest part of our job we have there. And also that in the institute themselves, and this is a brief thing, like in San Francisco or like in New York, there are those wonderful yodeling courses. Uh, if you wanted to, you could just get your yodel diploma, like a little you. <laughs> then you put something, you know, yodel diploma. That is kind of uh, society in German. Um, or it's, well, arts, it's about historic buildings, but especially like, you know, movies. Movies is the big thing in the Goethe Institute. They almost have little, you know, kind of home, home uh, theater. So, like maybe you have in your basement. So, about like this in San Francisco, half of it, a wonderful screen up there, mm -hmm. and really nice movie scenes in red, kind of plush. Um, would you like to sit on this chair for two hours? No. Yeah. So there are movie festivals in San Francisco, and people do come. I mean, from the Bay Area, of course. So this is something for, just a second, this is something for especially residents in DC, in New York, in San Francisco, and so on and so forth. Yes, please. Are the films subtitled? Mm, mostly because they are. watching a film in, a, in another mm. language is the most difficult thing you can do. You're, too, you're so right. But it's in German. It's all in German, no subtitles. That's difficult. Uh, it is difficult, but please don't forget, uh, about 50% of the people who come and watch are native Germans, mm -hmm. married in America, or, you know, like Peter Tchaikovsky, <laughs> or like Julia Koch. So all those people, you are so right. I mean, to watch a movie you don't know in a different language, in a foreign language, is pretty tough. Uh, but it is a German, and people come, and it is, you know, it's more a kind of social event. Yes, it is a movie, it's a movie festival, but it's also Prosecco, it's also, you know, who you are, who you talk to, uh, the German-American Chamber of Commerce. They have, the first time I was there, I learned a nice word that I mis kind of misunderstood first. Somebody said, I'm here to schmooze. <laughs> I was wondering what that was. <laughs> so, schmoozen. Do you know what that means in a context like you just kind of explained? It's not the German meaning behind it. It's kind of networking. You, you are together with somebody and, you know, maybe I can help you a little and then you can help me also a little. Uh, I give you this, I give you that, tit for tat. This is schmoozing, networking. So to go, to go to the Goethe Institute for a film night always means a lot of schmoozing. Um, interesting word. <laughs> so, especially for the German-American Chamber of Commerce. So it's networking. As you see, book trailers, Wagner and Buddhist was, I mean, <sighs> interesting. Can you see that? This is the program right now. I mean, in, in August. Sometimes, of course, it is bilingual, but also, if it comes to Herbert Grönemeyer, uh, that does not mean that he comes to the Goethe Institute, but again, teachers are invited um, to the Institute, and there are courses for them so they can ha, try to teach some of his songs, which is I think more difficult than watching a movie to understand what he says and what he sings. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. in my eyes, <laughs> uh, kind of special. Mm. <laughs> but you can whatever you want yet, you can just, that's what he said. Yeah. But you see, this is what it is other than working out in the field. 
it is a kind of event thing, movie especially, film festivals. San Francisco, for example, has a special person who is great in putting together excellent festivals and movies. And yes, uh, it's full. It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a crunk thing. Going to Maya. Well, September. I think I don't have more than 1,000 words. Uh, and I've had by now 980 words. So let's just sum it kind of sum it up. As you know, this is one of the slides I showed you a little earlier tonight. Goethe tries to convey, as you see, a comprehensive picture, cultural, social, and political life, especially for those who are the movers and shakers, like movie nights, like schmoozing, and all yeah. that, lobbying. And the real groundwork, grassroots work, that's what people like myself and one or two of my colleagues, we did. We promote, you know, German language, and by this, we foster international cultural cooperation. As money is tight these days, uh, my position when I went was axed, gone. Uh, so, so they don't have anybody like that. So whenever I am there, like this summer in the United States, on kind of family vacation, I start in San Francisco. Uh, well, and then it's kind of, doing a workshop now on a freelance basis. So I still do this, I go to Seattle, and uh, then my old team is still there, and we do it again on a different basis, and not as regular as it was, but so, so we still work on a different basis for the Goethe Institute and try to promote language and culture. And if that is something you, with your tax money, <laughs> kind of think is worthwhile doing, Goethe Institute, Germany, and the United States, as right here, Stars and Stripes, and why not have the Union Jack over there? <laughs> but I couldn't find a picture of all those three flags. I think now, then I think against a forum like this, intercultural, is the best thing of all. Yeah. So if that's the case, I thank you very much for your attention. I don't know your name, of course. No. You mentioned that the Americans uh, have no knowledge about Germany because we are so small on the map. But when Elvis Presley ah. came to, uh, to our country, yeah. all the neighbors said, Oh, you see the Rhine and the Lorelei. Yes. Give me an impression what you uh, what you. Uh, what you feel about the law. You're world. right. Uh, yeah. I mean, you, that is a good point. Um, as I said, I live in Seattle, and right there, there are two army camps, big ones, mm -hmm. Fort Lewis and whatever. And around those places, there were strong German colonies, kind of. Yeah. So a lot of American GI soldiers. Yeah, yeah. They kind, of, kind of married German women, and so Germany was pretty strong. And still, there are Sunday schools, language schools, so German schools for, you know, for the grands, grandchildren of yeah. those who came in the 50s and who want or whose parents or grandparents would love them to speak a little German. So yes, uh, but right now, you know, more and more GIs, well, we don't have that many GIs yet in, in Germany, and so one of the biggest promoters, uh, the army, yeah. 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 And Elvis, I mean, he was with the army, but that's a good point, yes. I have a question. Um, I heard uh, lots of um, good institutes uh, are closed now. Is it yes. true? Is it true? It's true. Worldwide? It's true. true. Worldwide, yes. yes. Um, you're yeah. right. Briefly, when I came to the States, there was another one, you know, except those I showed you. There was another one in Ann Arbor, Ohio. There was another one in Atlanta, Georgia. There was Houston, Texas. There was one, and they call it NAM, not Vietnam, but North America. You know, con in contrast to SAM, <laughs> South America. There was another NAM institute in Vancouver, 
in Toronto, in Ottawa, in Montreal, or Montreal. Now, there are those institutes, you know, now. And the other institutes have been kind of changed into friends of Goethe, kind of almost privately run little Goethe centers, of course, funded by Germany, but smaller, uh, you know, the um, you know, people they like the directors and so on. They don't come it's from Germany. They are not as expensive, uh, but they are still there on a much smaller scale. And yes, in LA, Los Angeles, they are also friend, friends of good fun. Yes, and this is a case we see worldwide. Yes, please. Uh, we got uh, from your lecture that the motivation is the key opener of a good lex of a good lecture or a good lesson. When I was in England, I spoke to a um, German-English teacher or English-German teacher, and then I asked him, what do you read in your lesson? Invest nichts Neues. And then he moaned about uh, the yes. English students who are not willing to learn. And I said, please, Understand. let it be, as yeah. Beatles said, it, it's a piece of literature, but not to motivate youngsters to learn as you, English. As you mentioned it, um, uh, All Quiet on the Western Front, that's the yeah. uh, title. My daughter, who went to school, of course, there, and yeah. then studied and now lives and works out of Seattle, she read in her English class yeah. um, All Quiet on the Western Front as a piece of German literature. But at the same time, they must read all things fall down, you know, African literature, Asian literature, very, 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 very intercultural. But you're right, uh, let those dogs kind of sleep for a while. Yeah, and then he moaned and said, the sh uh, students don't want to learn German. Is that, I mean, that's understandable, isn't it? <laughs> Goethe does a different job, as you know now. We promote soccer, we puppetry, we offer Überraschungs Eier, we yeah. work with Jürgen Klinsmann, uh, we do a lot of things which you may not expect from the kind of Goethe Institute. Yeah. But yeah. we just have to do that. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, why would we be there? You know, we are totally, we kind of, no, not kind of, we totally adapt to what the customer wants. Mm -hmm. If you don't do that in the United States, forget it. That's it. Yeah. You, you, yeah. Mentioned, you mentioned your daughter, I think yeah. that your son uh, is staying, he resident, is a resident of the USA now. Yes. And uh, what, uh, uh, what is the advantage for them for building world uh, young daughter or young, young son? That's a complex question that would require another night. But uh, briefly, yes. <laughs> briefly, I mean, you, you know her, of course. But also, um, she was a pretty good Quintana. Is that, you know what that, you know that. So yeah. Sixth graders. Uh, Second class. Schiller Gymnasium. But she had to work pretty hard. A classical German Gymnasium. Over in the United States, her teachers were brilliant pedagogues, mm. but methodologically pretty poor. So they worked in teams, they worked together, they phoned, they spoke, they chatted, I mean, not only chat things, but really worked on it. So she and her classmates, Vietnamese and American, it's like a little laboratory, they just worked and learned so much better than they would ever, than she would ever have learned here because teaching and school education is pretty poor. And she was, I don't know if maybe parents behind her and all that, but she was interested in, in education. She and her friends, she, they worked hard, very hard, and got a much, much better education, I think, than she would ever have gotten here. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You see, maybe just because educate or teachers um, are nice guys, excellent people, but how they teach is a little different. And so if you really want to do something, and it helped in the university, so she knew exactly what you wanted to do at the university that you've done, while others kind of, oh, what shall I do, you know, and uh, they just lose a year, and losing a year at the American university means losing money. 
Nothing. You know. So you can't if you can't afford to use to lose money, like 20, 40, 80 thousand, fine. But if you think, well, four years of studying, meaning for in-state, you learn, my daughter and my son, they were long enough in Washington State, so they were accepted as in-state students. And so it was not 40,000, it was just 20,000 a year. Well, you know, times two, enough. times four. But of course you could say, well, four years and that's it. Hard work, and that's very helpful, I think, for that. So against, um, they learn to learn for themselves. They learn to learn on their own. They learn to make decisions. For them, it was not like, I must, I must, I must. For them, it was, I choose to do. And that's a very interesting kind of change in attitude. Mm -hmm. She chose, and my son also, they chose to do this, and they didn't feel they had to. And that happened. And that, I think, yet is something one of the biggest uh, things they, they learned over there. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was very, very interesting. It was very enthusiastic. Yeah. I and can be that <laughs> if you like. <laughs> and we have to thank you very much yeah, for my pleasure. The, the, the big rainbow you, you put over uh, several things. And for me now I can I can imagine more what you did. Yes. Not not only lying on the beaches and, and no. the, <laughs> counting waves. <laughs> well, you're right. <laughs> okay, now okay. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.